This is our, our uh, 17th OIS meeting, the 9th at AAO, and again, thank you to the Academy for allowing us to do that. That's a, a great gift to us and to all the friends of OIS. Um, if you're not here, there are other meetings you can uh, attend. If you're interested in who's sitting with you, you can see it here. The blue is uh, are the are private companies, yellow are the larger companies, and the green are the thought leaders, and then we have lots of others, financiers, et cetera. It's, always, it's a mix that we've always tried to bring together, and it looks like it's working, so thank you for that as well. What's new over the last 12 months since the last time we've gotten together? We'll start with drugs, as we always do. This is not uh, working, so I'm, I may have to ask you to change. We do have a new FDA director, and Scott Gottlieb. He's a physician, uh, has been in, was in venture. He seems like he's saying the right things. Uh, I think he has uh, bigger fish to fry, perhaps, with the opioid, opioid epidemic and, and other issues, but we hope that he's good for us. Uh, we think he will be. If you look at the, um, the, uh, new, the original NDA BLA approvals and the transplant and ophthalmic division in yellow there compared to the entire agency, you can see the agency, I think, over, over the years has been doing better and trending up. Uh, we were about at uh, four approvals per year for many, many years. This year we're at two. And uh, this annual sort of approval number is a little bit misleading. If you cluster them by six, in six-year clusters, you can actually see that we've been slowing down in the transplant and ophthalmic group. Um, it's hard to divine why that may be. Uh, one, uh, one reason that we have heard, perhaps, is the reorganization that took, took place in 2011, just when we started to see the slowdown. It's, it's coincidental, not causal, but it is noteworthy that we now have a non-ophthalmic director of that division. It's always, I think, harder to make decisions when you're not a specialist in the area. And we, we know from just the reality of our own companies that there's a very conservative interpretation of, of ICH guidelines vis-a-vis IND-enabling toxicology. So for those of you that are uh, getting closer to an IND, please uh, take the time to make sure you know what the agency wants vis-a-vis -vis those requirements. We've also seen uh, um, a number of complete response letters in ophthalmology. Uh, I think 12 is the count that I was able to make. They're not all disclosed unless the companies disclose them, and five of those 12 were for CMC. So. Again, take care with your CMC issues. Often it's better to have two facilities than one if you can afford to do that. Here are the um, ophthalmic original um, NDA BLAs. You can see here a formulation of atrazine and uh, cetrazine, which is an antihistamine uh, called now Zerviate for ocular uh, uh, itch in allergic conjunctivitis going into what is a admittedly a crowded market, that will be marketed in the, UA, in the U.S. by Ivance, a, a new and emerging specialty pharma company that is looking to partner with companies who want to do see, these sorts of things. Now, Actemera, uh, the supplemental uh, approval for um, giant cell arteritis did not go through the ophthalmic division, but I think it's important to know for two reasons. First, as ophthalmologists, we do see giant cell arteritis and its effects on the optic nerve, and because the results were very, very impressive. A 53 versus 18 percent remission rate uh, versus standard of care corticosteroids in that particular case. And after my cutoff, but just for me, I'm told, uh, for this meeting, we now have approval of Visalta, which is a first in class in the last two decades glaucoma drug for intraocular pressure lowering. Uh, what do we have to look forward to, especially with regard to the FDA? Well, we know that SPARC, the uh, a first ophthalmic gene therapy for biallelic RPE65 mediated inherited retinal disease, that had a very positive uh, advisory committee, and we we're looking forward to that PDUFA date in January. Um, and many, many more gene therapies to come. That graph, which is the hockey stick going up and to the right, are the number of gene therapies that are in development, and many of them are ophthalmic. So I think we're, this is going to be a major transformation in the space. Um, ARI has a PDUFA date coming up for Ropressa. It will also be a, 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 new, cl a new class agent, the uh, ROC inhibitor, and then they reported their positive phase three data for the combination ROC Latan with Latanoprost, also very encouraging. Uh, in wet AMD, we saw the positive phase three results for br um, uh, brolicizumab, which is a small antibody fragment. You can see it's designed there that had two positive phase threes. Not much data were released. We'll hear about that at the Academy. I think Dr. Praveen Dugal is going to be presenting the data. Uh, there were some suggestions in the press release that it, there's some good durability associated with it. We're all go also going to have the, the results of the first topical, uh, the most advanced topical agent for um, a AMD with squalamine. I think January or February, Jason Slachter told me they anticipate being able to report their confirmatory results that were, this study was being designed on that uh, subgroup analysis. 
Also in 2018, we hope to now see increased durability of Lucentis through their uh, Foresight Vision 4 reservoir. Hopefully it'll be earlier rather than late in 2018. And we just kicked off at Gray Bug Vision a dose escalating study, which will then go into a randomization phase 2B3 study. Um, we hope to have those results in the first half of 2018, and this will extend it even beyond perhaps the six months or greater. So as you know, uh, compliance and durability have become sort of the new efficacy or one of the new efficacy end marks, very, very important in these studies. And we know that if we can increase compliance even to what we saw in protocols, we would get the same effect as, as many of the add-on therapies are hoping to achieve. So it's super important. Now, a little bit of old news but relevant, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the discussion is that uh, we had these noteworthy failures for PDGF, first with the Regeneron Phase 2B and then with the Optotech Phase 2B, and really put sort of a damper on uh, combination therapy and, and where that's going. Thankfully, we now have a couple companies that are saying perhaps that space is still open. Uptheia resulted, uh, reported rather what I think are very promising results with a clear drug effect of both vision gained and, um, and reduction in central thickness and even regression of the neovascularization in their phase one, two study that had a significant extension. And Iconic, which we'll present later, is going to share with you some uh, similar, similar pharmacodynamic effects on CNV activity and on durability. And I think people are waiting with great anticipation for the next big combination trials, the well-powered phase 2Bs that are going to come out of Roche, uh, combining an anti-VEGF approach with an angiopoietin-2 inhibitor. Genentech has its uh, sort of very novel first-in-class cross-MAB, but by specific antibody, first-in-class in ophthalmology, I should say. And then uh, Regeneron is actually co-formulating their ILEA with uh, their own anti-ANG2. So these, I think, are going to be very important studies. They're being studied both in DME and AMD. And the word is that they'll be out by the end of the year. Uh, it should be there or shortly thereafter. We had, as well, the report of, and we'll hear more about this later, of the first-in-class anti integrin by Allegro um, uh, Luminate, which would, uh, is for, in this case, for um, AMD. They also have other studies ongoing. Um, their, their subgroup analysis suggested it was better in, in experienced patients, not treatment naive, but I'm going to let uh, Vikin talk about that when he presents uh, later today. Tri-AMD has been a very interesting space. Um, unfortunately, we had another huge failure with lampolizumab, which um, I didn't particularly anticipate, but that's why they're called trials. That comes on the heels of several other fails, failures in the complement space. So lampolizumab was factor D, uh, the old Solaris trial was, fa oh, was C5A inhibitor, C5 inhibitor. The Novartis drug was a C5 inhibitor. And then we had the GSK failure, which ostensibly was an anti-beta amyloid, but that, as you may know, too, sort of feeds into the, the, to the complement cascade. And so we had these multiple failures in the complement uh, cascade vis-a-vis -vis turning it off or inhibiting it. Then comes the Pellis, which just recently, I'm told today, actually went public just recently reported their results and showed a therapeutic benefit to their, to their to dosing with their anti-C3 agent. So why does that work? Uh, it's, and why is it perhaps hard to understand? Uh, why are the C5 inhibitors at the bottom and then the, the sort of catalytic pathway, the, the factor D and the alternative pathway, not as effective as a three, C3 inhibitor? The short answer is we don't know with certainty. I think what the company, Apellus, would tell us is that this diagram that we're all very familiar with, which is the pathways feeding into the final common pathway of cell lysis, is perhaps one perspective, but not a perspective they would share. And that, in fact, the classical lectin and alternative pathway go through C3, a common node, to activate three different clearance pathways, opsonization, phagocytosis, cell lysis, and uh, chemotaxis adaptive, adaptive immunity. And cell lysis may or may not be particularly important for AMD, uh, especially since the, the complement bits are deposited on a membrane, basement membrane, and not on cells. Hence, the membrane's not going to lyse clearly. So we will see uh, if they can replicate in phase three, but there is a story that they're telling and it may, may make sense. I think it's important to note also that we had another, just after our last meeting, we had another positive phase two um, for, for dry MD with bromonidine, um, about the same size effect at a little earlier time point. Uh, uveitis, we mentioned that now Abvi has this uh, an, an approval for uh, Humira or adalimumab for non-infectious uveitis. Very impressive, given that we've had many, many large failures in phase three uveitis trials. 
and again, to remind you, we're waiting on Santen's uh, Padufa date, which I believe is December 24th or December uh, nonetheless. So it's an important year for them. Um, and we have now a couple of other entries in the uveitis space. So Civita has reported two positive phase threes with very impressive hazard ratios. You can see the deltas on the histograms. And we have ClearSide, which is in the midst of its uveitis trial. So uh, we do have sustained release treatments for uveitis. Some of them are shown here with Ozerdex and Kenalog, Triessence, Retisert, et cetera. It looks like we're going to have a couple to add to that armamentarium to treat these patients. Now, what about on the device side? You can see here the PMA approvals have been about where they've been for many years, at four a year. Most of them have been with novel lasers. There was one torque intraocular lens uh, that was approved. On the 510K side, again, a comparable number, about 2% of the total that the FDA re, uh, approves. And I'm just going to mention two of those because they've presented here in the past, and I think they're noteworthy. The first is the Zengel stent, 510K, because they used as a comparator trabeculectomy. Um, and that's going into a market now that already has commercialized both the iStent from Glaucos and the SidePass from uh, Alcon, uh, innovated and, and developed by Transcend. And then there are several other, uh, other products that are just behind them, both ab internal and external. And they are going into what I'm sure will be a very large uh, global MIGS market, as you can see the projected growth there. I also want to mention the uh, Zepto uh, capsulotomy instrument because they have presented here. You'll hear from them later. That's been approved and I, I believe is either launched or will be launched soon. Uh, this pr produces a, a perfect capsule rexus with, I'm told, um, stronger edges because of the effect of the instrument. On the de novo approval side, you can see that the curve is also up and to the right with 29 total. One was ophthalmic, this very novel device for dry eye oculeve, which has uh, been approved and is moving forward, very promising device. I've added in here just a couple companies that I want, I think are companies worth watching. Uh, I will say this, these are my opinions, so if you don't agree, so be it. I think these companies are hot and noteworthy. The first is a first-in-class pharmacotherapy for cataract or lens clarification. We've talked about this in the past. It's Viewpoint Therapeutics. When we heard from them two years ago, they had a, a, a sterile small molecule that could clarify mouse cataracts, and now they've replicated that activity in canine species. So they are pushing hard toward an IND, and I think that if it works in humans will be a big deal. We've already seen a big deal, literally, with Novartis and Encore over our lens pharmacotherapy, in this case for accommodation, not for clarification. The second is a first in class for uveal melanoma, a treatment that has been defined by radiotherapy for decades. And this is Aura, um, uh, Aura which uh, has a, an inactive viral capsid with a, an active toxic payload that's laser activated, binds to the tumor, and lyses the, the tumor there. These results from this phase one, two study will be reported by Carol Shields here at the, at the meeting, and I'd encourage you to go hear those very promising uh, results. We're not gonna talk much about reimbursement, but clearly it's a big deal. The government is, in, is concerned, the patients are concerned, and nowhere will it be a bigger issue than in gene therapy. Uh, this is a very nice article from the ophthalmologist that sort of outlines. I don't have time to outline the issues, really, but I think we're moving toward a pay-per-performance model in this arena. Uh, the academics think so, the payers want that, and I think the CEOs are capitulating to that requirement. It, there'll be big price tags, but as long as there's pay for performance, I think it'll be more acceptable. On the financing side, you can see that the NEI funding has stayed flat, but down in a sort of what you buy for dollars sense. There's a small and modest translational research budget in blue, these so-called SBIRs, and they're increasing, thankfully, although again, that's flat in buying power. Total VC money in is good on the biotech side. It's thankfully stable on the device side. That's overall a series of investments. You can see that there may be a, a slight, slight slip on the seed stage on the device side. Um, that's um, a reality that we have to get used to, unfortunately. And in ophthalmology, you can see here um, the device in yellow and the drugs in blue. The device, again, has really dropped off over time uh, recent years. Here's the therapeutic areas across ophthalmology. You can see AMD, glaucoma, and the vision correction IOLs remain strong. Ophthalmology, biopharma in the context of all disciplines. Onco oncology is the big dog here, as it always has been, but ophthalmology remains strong. And on the device side, fewer deals, but it remains strong. Just a few slides to end on the public side. Um, you know we have the OIS index with 30, 31 companies and about 16 billion. This is the index performance relative to device and drugs broadly. It's been about the same stable. There's a, a sharp drop down just before the end of last year when the Optotech data were reported, and that was Optotech. 
I think the market sentiments are balanced, uh, not particularly net positive or negative, but the reality is that there are fewer IPOs here. You can see ophthalmic in red, med tech and biotech. There just have been fewer, and so I think uh, IPO is not guaranteed over the next two years. You have to have a strong story to get out. There are a good number of M&A ac activities going on here. You can see biopharma relative to device broadly. In our arena, it's been about half device, so um, uh, people have been doing well on, on the exit side for devices in ophthalmology. You have to expect, as shown in yellow here, that many of these deals are gonna be with contingent value payments, both on the device and especially on the drug side. And we still don't know what Novartis is gonna do with Alcon. Jim Mazo is gonna find out for us in the last panel of the day. So join us um, for the next meeting, uh, which will be in, um, in uh, Vancouver, the ASC, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Vancouver, in DC at ASCRS and then uh, at ASRS in Vancouver and again at AAO in Chicago. Follow us with these uh, instruments that we've developed. I think you'll enjoy them. And come tomorrow if you haven't planned to how to commercialize your ophthalmic drug, our third masterclass. Thank you very much. Thank you.